Welcome to Palmyra Grace Church's Sermon of the Week. At Palmyra Grace Church, our purpose is to help people pursue a life with God together on mission. To that end, our hope is that each Sunday message influences your Monday and every day of the week. For more information about Palmyra Grace Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or find us at palmyragrace.org. Now here's this week's Sermon of the Week. Will you turn your Bibles to Matthew 7, verse 1. Matthew 7, verse 1, we are continuing our series, Kingdom Shape. And today's Kingdom Shape will be compassion. Compassion. I am from a dysfunctional family, right? Not defunctional. Said it wrong in the first service. Dysfunctional family, meaning it doesn't function right. No believers. We had um, a lot of arguing, a lot of fighting. We were allowed as children and teenagers to take our battles outside and fist fight it. And if you were the young one, you always lost. It's just how we were raised. A lot of bitterness, anger, and hatred. But at the age of 20, I became a Christian. I had a salvation experience. Jesus saved my soul. I did not know what that meant at that time. All I know is there was a lady in the neighborhood who started to love me with a love that I've never seen before. She didn't hate me. She loved me. She actually told me one day I was going to hell if I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Have you ever wanted to cancel someone out in your life? She should have got it. But after six months of her love coming after me, I came to a point where I just chose to believe in Jesus. And at that moment, something happened to me. My whole life, like, sparked. There was something that came into my life and changed me instantly. I didn't know what it was, but today I can say that I had a salvation experience. That the Holy Spirit of God came in my life and changed me, gave me a spiritual heart, something new that radically changed my shape of life. And I no longer wanted to be this person of hate and anger and bitterness anymore. The kingdom of God was starting to shape me. But there was one problem. I still lived in the family of hatred and bitterness. That was the experience. And they were vicious to me. And they still wanted to live in this bitterness and hatred. Broken people only know how to live broken lives. We can't expect them to change. Christ has to change that. But my sister particularly was a person who would always want to fight and argue with me. And everyone, she has not changed in the past 56 years of my life. She always had the win. She always wanted to fight with anger and bitterness. And I came to the point as a new Christian that I no longer wanted to do that. No one had to tell me it was in my heart. So one day I took, gave her a warning. He says, the next time you call that you're angry and you're bitter with me, I'm going to hang up the phone. You ever had to hang up the phone on someone? Can you do that with a cell phone? We usually say we drop it, right? So she called a couple weeks later. She was angry. She was bitter. She was mad at my father for something he said and he did 20 years ago, which she was right. And I said, sister, stop. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. I'm giving you a warning. If you don't stop, I'm going to hang up the phone. She didn't hear a word I said. Not even a word. She kept on going like I didn't say a word. I stopped her again. Can we say something nice about my parents? Can we say something good? Can we change the conversation? And if you don't stop, I'm going to hang up the phone. She didn't hear a word I say. Broken people don't hear truth. I didn't know that back then. She kept on going. It got to my third warning. Guess what happened? I hung the phone up. My sister had nothing to do with me for six years. She missed my wedding. She missed the first two births of my children. Nothing. It's like I didn't even exist. Have you ever wanted to pick up a pencil with a big eraser on it? 
and erase someone out of your life? I have one for you. Should we pass it around? Who will be first? Have you ever wanted to erase your sister out of your life? I have. I'm 56 years old. She's 57. And I still want to erase her out of my life. She hasn't changed a bit. You know, this eraser, this desire to, to cancel someone has gone crazy in our culture in the last five years, right? And it has a term. It's called cancel culture. It's literally a pencil with the name cancel culture on it. And you walk over and you erase someone out of your life. That's Christ-like. That's a kingdom shape, right? Wrong. This is not a kingdom shape of God. This is a culture of brokenness in our lives that we live in every day. You know, if I say one word wrong, just one word that I wrote or I said that I taught 10, 20 years ago that's still on tape, and if someone grabs that word, guess what happens? I could be a racist. And the culture I live in could literally erase me out. You know, politicians make a word. They make a career of this, do they not? They erase other people out of their lives, and they get elected. And they do nothing but cause inflation and all this crap that we go through every year. It's crazy. But we live it. One news channel speaks against another news channel, and they both have a race or canceling out people. Is that reality? What about my poor football teams? You, any Washington Rescues fans here? The Washington football team. <laughs> That's crazy. I can't believe it. My Syracuse orange men. I can't call them orange men because orange is offensive to the Indians of Syracuse area. I have to call them accused. So we have a fat pumpkin walking around. Orange. It's crazy. But we all live this. But you know, there is hope. Jesus never picked up a pencil and he never canceled anyone. And all the wisdom we have in the scriptures that Jesus once condemned anyone, that he once erased anyone out of his life, never. And he has a shape. And that shape is that. That's compassion. In the heart of Jesus Christ, never once did he walk by someone and say, I don't want nothing to do with it. Matter of fact, he would go to the cemetery and the guy up there was up there because no one could do anything with him. And he walked up there, he chased after him and set him free. He didn't erase him out of his life. He loved him. Have you ever desired to erase the cancel culture out of your life? We're seeing this in the heart of the church. We're erasing people out of our lives. I have good friends who've been football friends for years. They won't watch it NFL anymore because political greatness has hit the sport. I'm like, really? This is football. Here's our challenge today, my friends. Keem shape Christians are compassionate Christians that have a reckless love for God. That's our shape. Jesus never picked up the pencil. He had a love. He had a compassion to go after people, just like the lady that went after me, a lost, bitter, broken person. She went after me for six months. She didn't race me out of her life. She should have. I used to curse at her dinner table. I didn't know that those words were curse words. Can't use them anymore. She never said a word. So let's look at Matthew 7.1. Let's look at what this compassion looks like and what it doesn't look like. Verse 1. Jesus is pretty blunt. Do not judge. Okay, we've got to define judgment here. Do not judge. Judging here does not mean telling the truth. The Dallas Cowboys are the best football team in America, right? 
Yes, we got, who said no? You're wrong. You think it's Philadelphia? Oh, you guys got to get a life. You got lucky to win the Super Bowl. And a backup quarterback. And what have you been since? Nothing. We have five rings. And you're from New England. Just go back to New England. Okay, I don't want to hear it. But think about it. Did I judge the Philadelphia person? I determined what's good and bad. Did you judge me by saying the Cowboys are not the best team? Or saying yes? Yes. That is okay. I hear people always say to me, do not judge me. No, I'm not judging when I'm telling you the truth. That's not a judgment. What is a judgment? Judgment here is an unjust criticism that condemns and that separates from people. And Jesus says, do not judge. You know what he's saying? Don't pick up the eraser. Don't erase someone out of your life because they're different than you. Or they have a sin that's different than you. Or they look different than you. They're rich, they're white, they're poor, whatever. Don't condemn someone. You know that sister of mine? It's not my fault, she's my sister. It's my parents. And I can't condemn her because of that. Even though I want to. Everything in my flesh. Come on, she missed my wedding. Really? Think about it. Do not judge. Jesus is bold here. He just doesn't leave it. Don't judge. He challenges us. Why? Because compassionate Christians don't pick up the pencil. Because Jesus never picked it up. And if you do pick up the pencil, this is where you will go in life. Or you too will be what? Judged. And the judge here, the meaning judge here, is a human judge and the court, or Jesus Christ when he comes back as judge, to judge all righteousness and unrighteousness with a compassionate heart. Don't do it. Because if you judge, if you start condemning people and start separating from people, guess what's going to happen? Verse 2 will happen to you. For in the same way you judge others, you will be what? Judged. So if you take this pencil, let's measure it. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you judge someone, you cancel someone in your life, and you give four circles of this eraser, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get four circles of this eraser from someone else. And if you've ever been canceled, you know the pain. It's not fun. And Jesus is bold. He is honest. He is blunt. Right in the faces of his disciples and everyone on this mountain that he's teaching, he says, don't go there. Because if you do, it's your choice. You will be judged the same way you judge others. I wonder if he would say that today to some movements in our country, what would happen? You think they would cancel him? I think Jesus would be canceled in his first conversation. It would go worldwide. Because he would speak truth and everyone would say he's condemning. But he's never condemned anyone in his life. So what's the principle? Stop. Don't go there. Even though we desire it in our heart of hearts, in our flesh, don't go there. And as our culture goes there, don't go there. It's a dangerous street to go. But Jesus gets a little bit more personal in verse 3. I love his teachings. Not being raised in the scriptures, not knowing that there's a book in Matthew until I was 20 years old. These teachings are so correct. They are, they, they are their life. You follow these principles. There are some life principles in here, which I follow, and God has blessed me compared to anyone else in my family. It's amazing the truth in these principles. And he's so blunt. Look at this. He gets really personal. It's like he crawls up on your lap. You who want to pick up this pencil, you who want to erase, why do you look at the what? The speck of sawdust. 
This is not a little piece of dust that blows your eye from a saw. This is a sliver, a little sliver that comes from a saw and it shoots up and it sticks in your eye. It hurts. And you have to have someone to pull it out, preferably a doctor. It hurts. Why do you look at that speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to what? The plank. You know what the plank is here? It's the beam that holds up your whole house. You know, down in the basements, you who have basements, you got poles, you got a beam. That wood beam or metal beam is the plank. So what is Jesus saying here? You're looking, you who want to pick up a pencil and cancel people, you're looking at someone's small sin, which is great because you got to pull it out. It's in your eye. That's dangerous. But you have something wrong with you. You have a whole plank over your eye. You can't even see the reality of truth. Whoa. Verse 4. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? If I was sitting there underneath his teaching, I don't think I would be able to say anything. Because I can't. Have you ever tried to take the speck out of someone's eye? It just doesn't work. Ask any husband or wife that tries to chain each other partner. You're wasting time. My wife did that once. Dave, what's wrong with me? Can you tell me some sins to deal with? I love you just the way you are, dear. I'll let God deal with the specks. She got mad at me. Because she was expecting me to help. No, 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 I ain't going there. That's God's job. I have a plank, dear. But look at the next words. He doesn't mess around. He uses a word. Do we hear this any in our culture today? You hypocrite. You know how many people in the cancel culture have a plank over their eye? And Jesus was here today. He would look at them and call them a hypocrite. Oh, man. How he wouldn't the press would have fun with that one. But you do realize that Jesus was canceled on the cross because of these words. People condemned him to the cross. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So there's our challenge for the day. It's very simple. Take the plank out of your own eye. If you want to pick up this pencil, put it down. I have something else for you to do. I want you to take this plank out of your own eye. And once you take that plank out of your own eye, you'll be able to see to help your brother. See, compassionate Christians take the plank out of their own eyes. And I, I love Jesus' teaching, but... He didn't tell us how. He just left it. Left us for us teachers. But how? How do you take this plank out of your own eye? First, you've got to know what it is. Then you've got to understand that Jesus is more than a savior. He's the sanctifier. That he comes in your heart and takes all this out of your eye. But before we go there, Let's go to verse 6. Because Jesus is not done with his imagery. And this is the final warning for anyone who wants to get involved in the cancel culture and cancel people all your life. It's a pretty severe warning. Do not let, do not give dogs what is sacred. These are not pets in our home. I have two border collies. The most ambunctious dogs out there. One wasn't enough, so we got two. And they drive us crazy every day, all day, all night. But it's fun. Jesus is not talking about pets. The Jewish culture would never have a pet in their house. These, these dogs were unclean to the Jewish culture. They were wild animals. You do not give dogs what is sacred. That is the food that's offered in the temple to God of great value. 
God's. That's like your offer. That is what you offer to God. It's your value. Do not throw your pearls. What is the most important value to you? Do not throw them to pigs. And these are not pets either. These are wild animals. The Jewish culture, they were considered unclean. They wouldn't even touch them. What is Jesus saying here? Don't take what is your most precious thing, is your heart, your soul. Don't take that and throw it into this world of cancer culture. Don't take your heart and use it to cancel people and to judge and condemn people and separate from people. Don't go there because those people will do what to you? If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. I am so thankful for a kind wife. Every time that I've wanted to post in an argument, you know what she tells me? Don't, Dave. Come on, just once. I know she's your cousin, dear, but just once. She is so wrong. I have a right to carry a firearm in America. It's not a hunting rifle. It's for Misha, uh, Misha whatever that word is. And my wife says, don't. You know what I've done my whole life since I've been married to her? I've listened to her. There's not one crazy tweet, text, whatever out there that you could say I condemn the person. I wait until I get into someone's face to face. <laughs> because if you can't say it to a woman face to face, you're going to have marriage problems. And if you can't say it compassionately to people face to face, you're going to have job problems. If you can't say it face to face with love and truth, you're going to have problems with your children. Why write it when you can say it? But I've learned a principle from Pastor Dan because he always uses it with me. You know what he says to me? Can I push back a little bit, Dave? I'm like, oh God, do I really have to let him push back? Can I just say no? One of these days I'm going to. I'm going to say, you're wrong, Dan. I'm right. No, I can't push you back. But I have learned when someone says, no, I can't push back. You know what I do? I pull back, I stop, and I think before I open my mouth. So think about it. Compassionate people stop and think. Is this really worth pushing that button? I wish I would have known that when I had my conversation with my sister. Was it worth it? Hanging up the phone? No. So how do we do the how? How do we take this plank, this big old pencil that's in front of our eye, that we just want to cancel someone's life? How do we do that? That's the challenge today. And it's very simple. Number one, discover your plank. What is your plank? And if you don't know it, ask your wife. And if you're married, you know it already because your wife's already told you. And husbands, fathers, ask your children. And teenagers, if you don't know it, ask your best friend. Ask your dad. Ask the person that's the harder one in the family. There's two. Usually there's a mom or dad. One will let you do everything and one that won't let you do anything. Ask that person. That's just how marriage is, right? If you had two people that won't let you do anything, you won't survive in this world. But ask them. See, I don't need to ask them because I already know my plank. My plank is anger. I get angry inside. I was raised in an angry, bitter family. My first response is anger. When someone tells me I can't call the Washington Redskins, the Washington Redskins, I got to call them the Washington football team. I get angry. And if I was the owner of that team, you know what I would do? i changed change the mascot, not the name. Red Potato. And I would have my Red Potato running around the field. Just to show the cancer culture, you cannot win with me. That, I get angry. This is so dumb. Why do they do this? Who cares? Everyone's offended about something. Stop being so offended. That's how I think. I just get angry inside. It comes out. When Christians don't talk to Christians, being in the ministry for a few years, 
I've seen it. I go home angry. Why? We gotta go to heaven. Do you realize that the people that you don't talk to, you're gonna see for life in heaven? What are you gonna say when you go to heaven? Oh, I'm going over here and walk past you. I get angry inside. When my sister didn't come to my wedding, I got angry. How dare you? Really? That's my blind spot. Probably shouldn't preach. There's a lot of anger in me. And when I watch news channels, it's even worse. Can we just have someone tell us the truth on both sides so we can decide without your opinion? That used to be the newspapers. You had two articles. You had one story. You had two articles, two views. You had the choice. You read it. They taught you how to think. Don't get me going on education. That's really angry. The problem is my anger takes over. And if I do open my mouth, I think the person that needs compassion is going to see my anger. What is your plank? You've got to discover it. You've got to discover it. If you need any help, ask Pastor Dan. I'm not going there. But there is hope. Because not only can we discover our plank, but the second step of how is to discover that Jesus is much more than a savior. He is a sanctifier. Literally a sanctifier. When I got saved, there was a spiritual experience there. And he birthed a new heart that just transformed my lifestyle. But Jesus is not just a savior. If someone told you today that you were going to die in six weeks because you have cancer, would you seek Jesus Christ as a healer? And if he healed you, would you call him a healer? I would. But if someone pointed a blind spot out to you, and the Spirit pointed, a, a, pointed out a blind spot to you, would you not seek a sanctifier so he could touch you and take that right away? Literally erase it from your life? I think we should do that too. And when evil attacks my family, when evil attacks my friends, should I not seek Jesus as a deliverer for them and for my family? You bet. Over my dead body will I let that evil destroy my family. Because then I will rise up and call him a deliverer. And is Jesus coming back? Is he going to be our king forever? He's going to be our king so we have that hope he's going to come back. And we're going to experience that. We haven't experienced that yet. But can we still experience a sanctifier? It radically changes your life. And Paul taught this in 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 23. It's there on the screens. I beg you. If you have a blind spot that you cannot get rid of, this is the verse. This is your hope. It's the word of God and the power of God. May God himself, who? God, the creator of heaven and earth. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The mightiness of our creator. He is, he exists. May him, himself, the God of peace. The day I became a Christian, you know what happened to my soul? God stopped warning me. There was a peace there. There was no more war between that relationship. Oh, what an experience. I can't get over it. It's been 38 years and there's still no fight with God with me. There is peace there. He is not at war with us as his children. That God, may he what? Sanctify you. This is not a prayer for the end of the service. This is the prayer that Paul prayed for his people at the church of Thessalonica because he was asking God to give them an experience. 
to sanctify them. You know what sanctify means? It literally means to take out, to separate. It takes out my anger. I go to God and I pray, God, take this anger out. I know it's hard to love my sister, but I cannot love her unless you erase this anger out. And he sanctifies. He literally takes it out. And he fills it with compassion and love. You ever been there before? It's a beautiful place to be. But it doesn't stop there. He goes where? Through and through. I pray almost every morning, God, the, the, the hair atop my head. Thank you that I still have my hair. Thank you. It's great now. The, the, the one that sticks up the tallest into the, the end of my longest toenail. I pray that God goes through and through and through my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit. And just erase this anger out. And something happens. May your whole spirit, your whole soul. We don't write that in English, but it should be here. Your whole spirit. Your whole soul, your whole body, be what? Kept blameless in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I could be faithful to my God when I die, faithful to my wife when I die, and my kids still love me when I die, guess what? I have succeeded in life. That's better than most of the men in the Old Testament. Think about it. Jesus is there to sanctify, to literally take this mess out of our minds and erase it and put it on the cross out of our minds. And here's the promise. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will what? Do it. My salvation is a call. God put his hand on me and called me out. Literally called me out. And he gives me a promise that he, he just didn't leave me there to be saved. He's there with me every day through this blind spot. And he's willing to wipe it out, erase it out of my life. Wow. Someday I'll start sharing the stories of how much he's erased out of my life. But something happens to my heart. I'm able to love someone who has erased me out of her life. I've only seen her a few times, my sister, but I still can love her. I can't do that alone. My friends, the gay culture has canceled the church, and the church has canceled the gay culture in a lot of circles. And when sin takes its course, which it will, in this cancel culture, when we're, taught, we're called racist because of all these terms and everything, it's going to take its course. Who's going to be ready to love a group of people that's going to be lonely 40 years from now? It's the ones who can put down the pencil. And who have been sanctified by the love of Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you? What's your blind spot? And have you met your sanctifier? Let's pray. Father, we just quiet our souls. We ask that your spirit would work at this time. Thanks for joining us for this Sermon of the Week. If you found this sermon helpful, please share it with a friend in person or on social media. Let us know you were here by going to palmyragrace.org slash I was here. You can also sign up for our news and events at palmyragrace.org slash resources. We hope God spoke to you today and that you can share his good news with someone this week.